people know Lady Snowblood as that movie that inspired Kill Bill. I know it as that obscure movie that Kill Bill FUCKING RIPPED OFF TARANTINO YOU HACK! YOU STOLE MY FUCKING OBSCURE JAPANESE SHIT! KUDOSHITE! I actually really like Kill Bill, that was, that was just a joke. I hope you guys know that. Forgetting entirely the films that came after it, Lady Snowblood holds up as a fantastic movie. What many forget is that Lady Snowblood started as a manga co-created by Kazuo Koike. Two years prior, Koike started writing the iconic Lone Wolf and Cub, and would go on to do such hits as the fantastic Mad Bull 34. Much like Kill Bill, uh, I actually really do enjoy Mad Bull 34 on a purely unironic level. Now, before I delve into Snowblood, I just want to say that if you haven't seen it, you should. Fair warning, I'm going to go into plenty of spoilers in this video. I'm also going to give a quick review of the sequel. Eh, Lady Snowblood 2 is not a bad movie, it is an average movie. One that I wouldn't be surprised if it was a script repurposed into a sequel because the original got popular. Especially considering the way that Lady Snowblood ends. <laughs> But with that out of the way, let's move on to Lady Snowblood itself. The movie has such a brilliantly simple premise that's presented to us piece by piece. Our main character Yuki is going to avenge her mother by killing the four people who tortured her. That's straight and to the point and you can do a lot with that premise. However, we don't actually find any of this out until about a half hour in. Over the course of that half hour, we're given this information piece by piece. We start off with an opening that perfectly sets the tone for what's going to come next. This scene shows us Yuki as an agent of justice. She's almost like a superhero in the opening act, killing what is unequivocally a villain and doing it with such style. This entire scene glorifies her violence, and that's exactly the mindset that the movie wants you to have while you're going into it. As the movie continues, we go into Yuki's backstory. We see how Yuki's parents were attacked by these four people, killing her father and kidnapping her mother. Uh, I, I say father, but we'll get to that later. These four completely destroy this woman's life. And by the time they're through with her, Yuki's mother finds herself in jail. Now, Yuki's father is a bit of an inaccuracy. This man was killed before Yuki was conceived, let alone born. Her mother spends all of her time in jail, seducing the guards so that she can have a child. And she wants a child so that it will carry out her revenge. <laughs> In a way, Yuki has no father, because revenge itself is her father. And that's her motivation, that's it, revenge for her mother's sake. And at the end of the first chapter of the film, everything we've seen of these four horrible people leads us to believe that this is an entirely just cause, that Yuki is in the right. And of course, the very next chapter changes everything. Yuki finds one of her mother's rapists, Takemura Banzo, to be a drunken gambler. 
He's in so much debt that his daughter, Kobue, is selling herself into prostitution. Now, some might argue this is exactly what Bonzo deserves, but the movie doesn't treat this as karma. This man is at his lowest and he's bringing down a perfectly innocent person with him, somebody who cares about his well-being. And despite everything he's done, the audience actually starts to feel a little bad for him. We see him cheat at gambling just so that he can get enough money so that his daughter will stop prostituting herself. And then we see him get caught and almost killed because of it. This is the first, less glamorizing look we get at revenge. And it's something Yuki has to deal with too. This is pulled off fantastically by her actress, Meiko Kaji. With just a few well-placed pauses and looks, we can tell that she sympathizes with Bonzo's daughter. Interestingly enough, when Bonzo is caught gambling, Yuki goes out of her way to save his life. For the sole reason that she wants to be the one to kill him. <laughs> どう Yuki also gives Bonzo's daughter a way to contact her should anything happen to her father. Both these actions seem to go completely against Yuki's revenge. But this is Yuki showing some very human emotions before she eventually carries out her cold-blooded killing. <laughs> キラいてくれ。お願いだ。殺さない。お願いします。もしは死がしんだ。娘は米は頼む。頼む。米のためにも。<笑> And even as Bonzo is on the beach pleading for his life, Yuki doesn't show any signs of hesitation. She is so focused on her revenge that she ignores anything else that might get in the way. And this is what will carry through to the end of the film. The victim of chapter 3 is Yuki's only female target, Okono. Unlike Bonzo, Okono is doing pretty well for herself and definitely doesn't show any signs of remorse over her actions. This chapter also introduces Ashio Ryure, a love interest of sorts for Yuki. He ends up publicizing Yuki's story, ironically glorifying her revenge as the movie does the exact opposite. This could probably be read as a way of the media glorifying violence but I'm not gonna go into that. Point is, after several events involving Ryude getting captured and Yuki being Yuki and mowing down everyone in sight, at the end of all this, Yuki goes to face Okono. However, once again, she's denied a satisfying revenge. this completely logically, then her revenge is still complete. Okono is dead, or at least dying, as Yuki starts to hear her final heartbeats. Much like Bonzo earlier, Yuki is more concerned about being the one to take her life than the actual act of killing, which is why she ends up cutting Okono in half instead of just letting her hang. Yuki. <laughs> 
Yuki's final target, Gishudo, actually ends up taking a combination of elements from the earlier two. Like Okuno, Gishudo is doing very well for himself and has amassed a vast amount of wealth. He lives like a king in a giant western mansion. And like Bonzo, Gishudo has a child of his own, this time being someone much closer to Yuki, Ryude. Now don't get me wrong, Gishudo is absolutely someone who deserves the death that is coming to him. Someone who doesn't is his son. However, upon learning that Ryude is the son of her mother's rapist, Yuki gives him a look that's all familiar to her victims. And while it's never stated outright, Kaji's performance implies that after the revelation that Ryude is Gishiro's son, Yuki holds some resentment towards him. He sides with Yuki completely, and even helps her to accomplish her revenge to make amends. And this is what makes the final confrontation all the more tragic. SPOILERS FOR THE END OF THE MOVIE! <coughs> Yuki and Ryude finally have Gishiro backed into a corner, until he takes out his gun. After getting shot several times, Ryude manages to hold back his father and tells Yuki to go in for the kill. <laughs> now it's entirely up for debate, but either way the outcome ends up being same. Failing to get an open shot at Gishido, Yuki stabs through Ryude, killing both of them. Some might argue that this is ridiculous. Yuki could have just moved him aside and then killed Gishido. That is, unless Yuki wanted to kill Ryude too. Game theory. As the son of Gishido, some of his father's karma might have come around to stab him in the back. And although she does feel remorse at Ryude's death, Yuki might have seen killing him as just an extension of her revenge. Of course, intentional or not, Yuki has sacrificed a completely innocent person in order to get her revenge. And this is more important than anything that she had going behind it. Because in doing so, she has lost any sense of justice that she had at the beginning of the movie. We can no longer say that she is unequivocally in the right when she takes her action. And in one last scene of irony, Kobue comes back and stabs Yuki, leaving her to die out in the snow. But as she's stabbed, Yuki seems content, as if it was perfectly reasonable because admittedly, it's the same path that Yuki took. Ironically, Lady Snowblood takes the opposite approach from Kill Bill. In fact, I'd argue that Kill Bill probably takes the opposite approach to separate itself from Snowblood. Where Kill Bill glamorizes revenge, Snowblood shows it in a much more unsatisfying light. We never get back to the cut and dry opening. While Yuki sets out to kill four irredeemable people, she ends up killing a poor drunken father, a woman who's already dying, and the closest thing she has to a lover. While the actual violence in the movie might be stylized and glamorized, Yuki is always undercut just before she's about to take her revenge. And although she does get her revenge in the end, she's lost whatever high ground she had at the beginning. And what really makes Lady Snowblood interesting is the character herself. Meiko Kaji is Lady Snowblood. Her performance is what makes this character interesting. She has this glare that no one can quite replicate, but that's that's what Meiko Kaji's good at. Yuki never shows regret over her targets, but she's not incapable of emotion. She's kind to Kobue, amicable to Ryude, but there's no sympathy for her targets. Nothing ever clouds her judgment because she sees revenge is justice, even when the entire movie is built around denying her that justice. And that's why she's so insistent on being the one to kill them. Because if she isn't, then her mother hasn't actually been avenged. She could have let Bonzo die in the gambler's den. She could have let Okuno hang. But if she's not the one to kill them, then justice hasn't been served. The only one that ends up putting up a real fight is also the one that leads her to kill Ryude. And this is why Yuki smiles at the end when Kobue stabs her. Because to Yuki, Kobue has her justice. It makes sense to Yuki that this would be the person to kill her. And so she goes off to die alone in the snow of the netherworld. Until you get to the sequel where she's okay for no reason. Onna wa toni sutei.